you've openly confessed that you had cheated on your ex-wife multiple times. Right. How do you go from falling in love, proposing, marrying, and then breaking her heart and cheating on her? It's not the other person's fault. That's the first thing we have to understand is that a lot of times people say, I cheated because this person. No, I cheated because I had a lack of integrity. I uh, didn't realize that lack of integrity until certain things began to happen in my marriage to where I felt like my needs weren't being met. And so I went externally for something that I should have went internally for, whether that internally would be with having those tough conversations with my wife or even dealing with the pain and, the, and then getting healed from my past trauma. You know, I watched my father uh, never, we always knew that my father cheated, you know, felt like he had a whole nother situation outside the home, but we never talked about it. But subconsciously, I always said as a kid, I'm gonna never be like my dad. And then I found myself being everything that I despised. But what I didn't realize is that it was that brokenness, that 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 inner trauma that I had been dealing with that I'd never talked about. Um, I always say God can't heal what you won't reveal. So if I'm dealing with something inwardly, it's gonna come out. My mom used to always say, what happens in the dark comes to light. And so when I felt like my needs weren't met in my relationship, uh, I remember my wife used to always tell me, prior to getting married, she said, don't think our marriage is gonna be based on sex. And I was like, okay, it's not gonna be based on sex. I didn't understand to have that follow-up question, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? What do you believe is the healthy frequency of sex? We have to get to those levels of conversation because we have to understand some people may say, I think a healthy sex life is twice a week. Then someone may say, oh no, I need to have at least three times a day. Then you have to have the conversation like, hold on. So if you expect it three times a day and I can only give it to you twice a week, then where's the happy medium? It has to be some compromise. Marriage is all about compromise. But when you don't even have those questions and you don't even uh, pose those questions to even get those answers, then now I'm inwardly dealing with whatever it is, my needs not being met and not communicating that. And so I'm privately dealing with those things on my own, leaving it up to my own devices saying that, well, if she don't want to have sex today, well, I'm going to go ahead and go get find somebody else to take care of it. But it happened gradually. It started off with me saying, well... I'm gonna go ahead and just masturbate. So I'm gonna masturbate. I'm gonna I'm take care of it myself. And then one day I went into the nightstand, I got the lubrication and I would go in the shower, I would take care of myself. I would do that a couple of times a week. One day I forgot to take it back out of the shower. I left the house and I was like, oh my God, I forgot to get the lubrication out the shower. So I was like, oh my God. So at that moment I was like, if she saw it, I didn't want her to feel inadequate. I didn't want her to feel like I wasn't being uh, pleased in my marriage. And um, I was like, okay. So when I came back to the house, I went and looked in the shower. I noticed it was gone. She was sitting in the bed and I was like, I might as well address the elephant in the room. And so I said, hey, um, I noticed that the lubrication, you moved the, uh, the lubrication out the shower. She said, I did. And I said, so what do you think about that? She said, what do you mean? I said, what, what do you think about that? She said, I mean, you had to take care of yourself. And I was like, so that's it. She's like, yeah, I mean, if you got to take care of yourself, take care of yourself. At first, I felt like she was feeling inadequate, but then it was the opposite. You know, um, she didn't feel like it was her responsibility to make sure that her husband's needs were being filled. And I was like, so now I turned in that moment made me turn into resentment. It turned to it turned into a great deal of resentment. And so uh when I decided to masturbate after those moments, at first I would think about her when I masturbated. And then at that point, I could no longer uh, even get erect thinking about her. And um, I had to recall memories of women in the past where sex was more free, where it wasn't feeling like it was so restricted. And, and that's where I would be able to take care of myself. And so I never did talk to her about that at all. I would always just ask her like in moments where, you know, I, I wanted sex or whatnot, that um, I would try to initiate. She's like, ah, I don't really feel like, you know, I'm just, we should have asked earlier, you know, I just, I just had a big dinner or whatever. And I was just like, okay, everything's a problem. And so what happened, this is the trick of the enemy, is that those private thoughts that I started having, thinking about, it was this one particular woman that I would fantasize about or recall the memories that we, uh, you know, that we had in the past. Then lo and behold, I run into that individual at a fashion show. And then she walks up to me, and that day, I had masturbated thinking about her. And then I run into her, she's like, hey, and I'm like, 
you know, <laughs> I'm like, I felt like my private thoughts done jumped out mm -hmm. in front of me in 3D. And so I said, I said, oh, she said, hey, she says, uh, so how's married life? I said, oh, everything's great. Everything's great. And she was like, hey, we need to catch up. And I was like, ah, should I get her new number? Oh, let me, I'll just go and get a new number. It, it'll be a little harmless. I go to her house a couple of weeks after that. We're sitting there talking. Um, it starts with reminiscing. You remember when, you remember that little futon over there? You remember what we did on the little futon? Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that was there. Then she starts trying to initiate sex in that moment. I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm married. I know I'm married. Because, again, I was that guy that would always reprimand my homeboy saying, why would you get married if you're going to cheat? And here it is, my first year of marriage um, with the uh, temptation to cheat. Why do you even think that that was even likely for me? And so... I get out that situation, but now that seed has been planted. Gosh, I remember when, and I'm still masturbating, thinking about her. And that's why we have to be very conscious about our private thoughts. My mom always said, what happens in the dark comes to the light. If I'm thinking over those things, if I'm stewing over those things, if I'm fantasizing those things, then those things begin to resurface. And now when you're presented with it, it's like, oh, here it is. Here's your fantasy that you want. It's like the Matrix movie, what pill you going to take? Um, and so in that moment, I ended up going back to her house one day, and then that's when I, I actually had sex with her. I felt like trash. I got in the car. I was like, I want to throw up. I just, I literally felt the veil of my marriage be, be, uh, being torn. And I felt like I was, when I walked back into the household, I felt like I walked into the house with the blazoned image of the letter A on my forehead of, of adultery. And I walked in, I was like, I bet she can see it. So the first thing I did, ran, jumped in the shower, took a shower, tried to wash off my sin, you know? And then um, I was like, okay, I'm never going to do that again. But I couldn't stop. I have so many questions. Let's talk. Um, first of all, when you said it was your first year of marriage, but you had actually been dating but what was it, six? Six, six or six or seven years. Yeah, so what is it about dating's fine, but then as soon as you get married, that it becomes, is it the, the, the feeling of being handcuffed? What is the difference between then the dating and the marriage to you? Well, for us, because we had a Christian relationship, uh, she never wanted to have sex prior to marriage. And so, and even though we had our slip ups and we would have sex, it was never something that was uh, habitual. It was never something that became the norm. And so even in that dating process, I cheated on her with the same woman back then. Oh. So I cheated on her during that moment and ended up telling her about it. And I was like, this is what it is, this is what happened. And at that time, I thought the relationship was going to be over, which it, we broke up and we ended it or whatnot. Um, and then I guess about a couple of weeks later, we ended up getting back together. Uh, because the girl told my my girlfriend, who later became my wife, she told her that. She told her that because she found out I had messed with this other girl, got mad about it, and then told my girlfriend at the time. That's so pretty much your, your boyfriend cheating on both of us kind of conversation. Whoa, okay. So in that moment then, you said you got back together a couple of weeks later. Right. What were you telling her? that allowed you guys to reconnect? Were you saying, oh, it was just once, or oh, I'm sorry? No, say, I told you, they, they didn't mean anything. Like, they, they, they literally didn't mean anything. And, and that's the thing about it. A lot of women, it's hard for them to digest that truth. You tell me that I mean everything right. and you'll risk everything for something that means nothing. Yes, help me understand that because I still don't get it. Men are physical beings. Men can literally lay down with a woman and get up and care, care less if they see that woman again. Could care less. And he'll lie to the woman that he loves the most to protect what he feels he has with her. But the other woman, he could... And he, he will tell that other woman right in front of the woman he loves, you mean nothing to me. This is my wife. This is my the mother of my child. This is my... Whoever she is to him, this is my girlfriend. You mean nothing to me. And then the woman is like... The, the woman that, that he's in a relationship with was like, well, why would you give this woman so much power with experiencing you on an intimate level like this if she doesn't mean anything? And the reality is that's the duality of the truth. The, the duality is she didn't. 
it was a physical transaction, but I really do. And who am I spending my time with? Who am I inviting to 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 the uh, Thanksgiving dinners and the Christmas dinners with? Who who am I spending family reunions with? You, my wife. You, my girlfriend. You, my fiance. And that's the and that's the challenge. And, th and that's why I say it's a very selfish mentality, extremely selfish. But it is the reality. Mm, yeah, um, and that's really what I want to talk about today, right, is about that reality. Because for me, the reason why I do this show is to empower women to be able to take um, what they want in life into their own hands, to take their power back when right. they don't feel like they have the power. And so I think step number one is understanding. Um, and so, again, thank you for being very transparent. So in those moments, uh, in fact, I've heard you say, if anyone ever spoke badly of your wife or your girlfriend, you would have killed, like, you're Mr. Protector. Yes. You protect her from everything. Yeah. But then you break her heart. Tremendously. So how, in those moments where you're about to cheat, especially for that first time when you get married, right. do you tell yourself this is going to break her heart and she may leave you? I didn't think I thought of that at all. Really? I, th I thought of, uh, she's just never going to find out. See, it's the thing about if I ever thought that hard about it, I probably wouldn't have done it. I probably wouldn't even been able to perform in the experience because the guilt would be so heavy that I couldn't even get erect in the moment. My mind was, she's never gonna find out. And think how crazy this is. The, the woman that I cheated with her, cheated on my wife with, was a woman that told my wife mm -hmm. in the past when we were dating that I cheated. So look at the psychology of that. It makes no sense whatsoever. It's utter ridiculousness. But the reality was, I still had a level of trust with that woman to say, ah, but she's not going to do this again. She's just not going to do it. And granted, she never did. Uh, but the reality was I didn't consider the heart of my wife. And that's why I say we have to do a better job on loving that other individual. It's not about what we can get away with. It's about caring for the heart of that person and, the, and, the, and to take into reality, if someone was treating you the same way, how would you feel? If my wife was cheating on me, I would lose it. I would absolutely lose it and be like, it's over, done. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't expect, I wouldn't try to give her grace, the same level of grace that I expected from her. I, I would have done that. It's such a hypocritical mindset. And so, but I didn't consider her hard at all. I actually heard you say you kind of wish that she did cheat on you for you to feel better about yourself that you cheated on her. 100%. That's like ease the guilt. 100% because she wasn't even the type of woman to throw it back in my face after we was going through counseling or whatnot. Uh, but I knew that she was privately, like, she detached herself from me a, a great deal in our marriage. And I felt the, the, the shame of that. What made me want her to cheat uh, as a revenge to me is because I felt so much shame. It wasn't anything that she was projecting on me is what I felt internally. I was like, I'm, I'm worthless. I'm I'm a horrible person, you know what I'm saying? And because I did value marriage, I valued those vows that I took, but my idiosyncrasies wasn't, I couldn't overcome those, because I had no tool, I didn't talk to nobody about it, I didn't, I didn't have no mentor to be like, hey man, I'm struggling in this area, my wife is this, I feel like this, what should I do? I didn't talk to nobody about it. My homeboys didn't even know I was cheating. So when my wife and I got divorced, which is a, the divorce I filed for, they was like, what? Everything was great. What, what, what happened? You know what I'm saying? Because they never heard me say anything negative about my wife. It was literally me suffering in silence. So with that suffering of the shame, the guilt, you, I think you said after the very first time you felt so shameful, you wanted to pull over because you were feeling like you wanted to throw up. Yeah. Like that intense feeling yeah. sometimes can teach someone, oh, don't do not do that again. Yeah. But it didn't teach you that. Why was that? Because the issue was still not resolved. Mm. And was the issue just like, when I say just, obviously it's very important. Sex yeah. is such a big part of relationships, I believe. Um, intimacy, touching, things like that. But was that the re like? That was the that was the reason. It was not just the physical aspect of sex, but it was the the intimacy of it. The intimacy from both ways, because I realized that my problem was I wasn't serving her needs. At 27, 28 years old when I got married, I didn't know anything about intimacy. All I knew about was sex. Period. And the truth be told is the people that I experienced intercourse with, it was only sex. In a marriage, requir marriage requires intimacy. 
I didn't know how to transition from sex to intimacy. And so I would subconsciously compare my wife to the women in the past, but it's an unfair comparison because that was just sex. She required intimacy. And I'll tell you this, Lisa, what happened was is in our first year of marriage, one day she came home and she had this feather. And I call this the feather story. She came home with this feather and she was just like, here, she said, rub this on me. I was like, this is another obstacle. This don't make no sense. What in the world is this feather going to do? Never vocalize that. That's internal. So she's laying there and I'm rubbing her body with the feather. Like, this is so stupid. I don't know what this is doing for her. She just always just complicated. Why does everything now I got this feather? She just, all these thoughts in my head. So now I'm giving her the same energy of, I don't care about what you need in this moment. I'm just trying to hurry up and get to this moment where I can have sex. You're wanting to make love. I'm wanting sex. This is what is happening. And, and this is what I'm communicating with my actions, but don't have the wording, don't have the framework for it, don't even have the understanding, but this is what I'm projecting. So I'm doing this haphazardly. And um, eventually I end up stopping and end up, you know, going to have sex or whatever with her. But God brought that to my remembrance last year. Now I've been divorced going on eight years in December. December 30th will be eight years. And God brings this back to my remembrance and I'm going, gosh, I was so selfish. Oh my God. I'm like, how did I miss that? How did I miss this? How did I miss this moment? Um, and what happened was I, re I recalled that it wasn't that she was, she didn't want to have sex. She just didn't want it the way that I was giving it. She wanted intimacy. She wanted lovemaking. And when she said our marriage ain't going to be based on sex, she didn't have the framework to say, I want you to honor my body. I want you to make love to me. I want you to handle me with care, as delicate as a feather. She, she didn't communicate that. She just brought a feather and said, here, rub this on me. And so what I always do is I reverse engineer my life and I go, what did I do wrong? Why didn't that not work out? Because I'm supposed to be the leader in my marriage. I failed. If she's not giving me what I needed, how did I not lead her properly in, into executing uh, my needs? Because it goes back on me. So I said, the feather. I didn't create a place of intimacy for her. And so she couldn't express herself physically in the way that she wanted to um, because I didn't create that safe space for her. And then just to add to that, as a woman, when you're approaching a guy, even if it's your husband, with something like that, you're very vulnerable. Yes. So for her to reach out to you and say, here's a feather, was probably a really big deal for her. Yes. And so for her, she's putting herself out there. She's feeling really vulnerable. She can tell you're just like, as if it's like a paintbrush. Exactly. And now she doesn't feel seen. She doesn't feel heard. She doesn't feel like her needs are now met. Um, and so it's like these interpretations of actions being in your own head, not communicating, and then ending up on very different parts. Exactly. So talk to me though, because you guys went to counseling before you got married. Yes, premarital so, counseling. Which I I think is amazing. Yeah. So what was it about the premarital counseling, then the counseling, that none of that actually helped you guys communicate in an order for you both to then vocalize your needs? We Sometimes in counseling, what happened with us, we never ever said, what like we'll 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 talk about the the overarching need, which is, hey, for, they start off with group counseling. They say the number one need for a man is sex, and they need respect, and then a woman needs to feel safe, and she needs all this stuff. You'll say that, but what does that look like broken down? What does that really truly look like implemented in marriage? We know this. Oh, a woman needs to feel safe. We know that. But what does that look like? <laughs> so so I heard that she heard my need. But then we didn't break that down to say, okay, what does sex look like for you? Does sex look like um, um, frequency? Does sex even look like, I've talked to some couples where a guy marries the woman or even vice versa, where they have an open marriage, where they're having threesomes and everything else, but they never, ever discuss that. So a guy gets married to the woman and be like, hey, I want to invite somebody else in the bedroom. Why did you tell me that earlier? Like, I don't do that. Oh man, I just thought that, man, I mean, why did you could have communicated that way before our vows and then let me decide to sign up for what I desire. So that's what happened is that we had these things inwardly that we just didn't discuss on what that looked like truly 
played out and implemented in our marriage. And so we have these conversations and they're um, high level conversations, but when we break it down to say, what does that really look like? We didn't, we didn't talk about it. And so then they always say the little foxes uh, destroy the vines. It's those little foxes that begin to say, hey, you feel rejected in that moment of tears when you went to try to rub her shoulders and she used to love massages. So I rub, rub, rub. Let me talk about that. She loved massages. And so I felt like giving her a massage would be the foreplay to get my needs met. But as I become a grown man, meet the needs without any expectation. So I should be able to say, you want to be massaged? I'm a massage. You, you good? All right, we're going to go watch TV. And she's looking like, oh, well, hold on. And if you execute that properly, uh, consistently, you'll find yourself, that woman be like, hey, you done got me ready. I, you, you watching TV now, she done climbed up on your lap. You know what I'm saying? So it's, 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 marriage is about sacrifice. It's about, I am here to give to you. I want to make this experience great for you. And in return, I guarantee you, that person, unless they're totally selfish, will go ahead and meet those needs that you have too. Because they're going to feel like, gosh, she's so sacrificial, so loving, so 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 nurturing of my heart. I'm going to go ahead and take care of them, you know? And that's what it should be. But at 28 years old, I didn't understand all that. You just literally just focused on your own needs, what you were getting out of the relationship and not necessarily what her she was. My thing that I felt like women needed and my wife needed was just make sure the finances are taken care of. I got the bills taken care of. If you want to work, you can work. If you don't, I got to take care of. And so my 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 ex-wife didn't work, you know, and um, it was it was I was just I was like, hey, it's fine. And so I felt like I'm meeting your need, so mm -hmm. meet my need. Okay, so I heard you um, filed for bankruptcy though at some yeah. point. So how yep. did that? If you've been brought up with the idea that that is what a man does, that is what a husband does. He provides her with a roof over her head and she doesn't have to work and now you're a good husband. Right. And then you have to file for bankruptcy. Boy, what did that do to you then? It made me feel like I didn't deserve a wife. So prior to going into that, in 2010 when I filed for bankruptcy, uh, I was touring shows across the country and uh, had plays and I was making a lot of money from that. And then a business deal that I had from one of my plays, the, the, the promoters, or the investors, they didn't pay me my money. And so I was like, either I'm gonna sue them, which is gonna be even more costly, and I didn't have a whole lot of money to be suing people with that much money, because I've heard them talk about other people that we were working with. They was like, oh, we'll drag them out in court and force them to file bankruptcy. And I was like, ooh, now I'm on the other side of this. They're gonna do the same thing to me. Mm. I said, oh God, so I said, man, I'm gonna chalk it up. Well, as a chain reaction, my household bills, I just couldn't pay. And so then I felt like, I don't deserve a I don't deserve a wife at this point. And so I remember that year or coming out of that moment of uh depression, I had to research, it was approaching my anniversary, and I had to look up the word husband. Like I, I was like, if I'm required to be a husband, I don't even know what that means. We 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 call ourselves wives, we call ourselves husbands, but what does that really mean? So I, I trace back the etymology of the word husband. And um husband means one who bands his house together. It, it, it's, that's why it's called a husbande, one who bands his house together. And I said, I haven't been banding my house together. I haven't been able to be the glue because in my culture, um, the women were the glue in the marriage, in the relationships, in the family. They're the ones that keep the family together. They're the ones. And I said, wow, that's crazy because the, I, we've we've subconsciously put women in that position in the, in the African-American culture when it should be the man standing 10 toes down saying, hey, if my son begins to be wayward and he's in a crack house, then the father goes there. But most of the time the fathers are absent. And so then you go, so the mom is doing that. The mom is going to the PTA meetings. The mom is always making sure the family is secure. And so that was a very convicting thing when I looked that up and I said, and that's why I feel so deficient and, uh, ineffective as a husband because now my money is funny, I don't deserve a wife. And that didn't do nothing but open it up for me to cheat even more to self mm. to, to self-sabotage. Wow, God, yeah, that's so true. And um was that almost like compounding of the shame? Like Yes. Yes. Because here it is, now I'm broke and now I'm self-medicating off mm. of the women. And saying now 
I can do this great. Now, this is what I can do well. It's so much that men attach to their, to their sexual powers. It's so much because it's like something that we can do well. And if we really want to think about it, even trans, it even traces back to slavery in the African-American community is because they would use the man. They would use the strong buff man to go procreate stronger slaves. And so, so what happened is subconsciously on that level, it was like, well, I can find my value in this. And so now I'm going to go have sex with this woman. I can meet her needs for this moment. And ah, that made me feel good. I felt like I was, uh, I, I'm, I'm a great guy. And then you get back to reality and you're like, I'm horrible. My, my bills are now uh, waning. I can't afford to pay this. Now I'm about to move out of the condo that I end up buying and end up having to move into a, a duplex that became one of our rental properties that she owned prior to us meeting. So now I feel less than a man. Now I'm living in the, the, her place. Now I always call it, this is your place. She was like, this is not my place, our place, your place, it's your place. Because I put so much value in, let me go build this, let me go get this great condo, let me get this. And now this is a life I gave us. And one day she told me, she said, I never wanted this life. And I was like, what you mean? Of course you did. She's like, I didn't care about all this. And what she said in that moment, we were sitting on the floor. I would never forget this. I'm about to choke up thinking about this. It was our New Year's Eve, and we had to move out by New Year's uh, because the HOA foreclosed on my condo. And uh, it was like $12,000. Um, not only, and I had owned, uh, owed um, the bank like 20 some thousand, but the HOA ended up foreclosing before the bank did. And so we were sitting on the floor and uh, it's this movie I used to love called uh, Dick and Jane mm. with Jim Carrey. And it was, th that movie was such, I feel like that's a, a marriage counseling movie because they had nothing and they just stayed together. They, they were still in, he was still in patches out of people's grass so his wife could get grass in the yard. It was, it was hilarious. But I remember finding so much solace in that movie. Well, we had that Dick and Jane moment sitting on the floor saying, uh, we had took the countertops <laughs> off of the off the condo. It was a beautiful granite countertop. I was like, we're gonna take this countertop and we're gonna use it in a duplex. We're gonna upgrade it. We had took all the stuff out, took the toilet out the thing. <laughs> sitting there. And we're sitting there and I said, she said, Lateris, I never wanted all of this. And I said, but you did, like you liked it. You liked that you were able to just walk across the street to the CVS and you liked that. She said, I liked it, but I didn't require all this. I just wanted you. When I tell you, I felt this big. And I said, I chased money. I chased trying to provide for my family. And still, even in the provision, I still lacked vision for my marriage. I still lacked vision for actually seeing her as the woman, as the wife that God created for me because I was so busy trying to make provision that I forgot the vision. Mm. Oh God, that's so strong. Um, there's so much there. One of the things that really struck me that you said is that you were self-medicating. I've never thought about cheating as a self-medication. But what's interesting is I would have a very different thought process if you told me you're an alcoholic or a drug addict. Yep. Or a, th or a thief. Yep, yep. You 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 will say, oh, I understand that. I understand that you're you're drinking to get away from your struggles and and the pressures of the day. But sex is one of the greatest drugs because you get it's a reason why an orgasm feels so good, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so people chase that oftentimes. And so and that's and that's what I did. It was the moment of and what I would chase was the moment of making that woman feel good. You know, because that made me feel like I did something right in this moment, mm. you know. And so that's from a subconscious. Of course, I never even understood that in that moment. This is hindsight being 2020, looking back over that and going, wow, I was a piece of work and didn't even know it. Mm. You know, just looking back over those choices I made in the past. And that's the reason why I'm so transparent about it is because I said that, listen, and I get so many men and women who DM me after hearing my story and say, hey, I've been cheating on my, my husband for the last 11 years. And I, no one knows this, but I felt like you're a safe place to, to share this with. How do I stop? 
I'm actually glad you said that because you've interviewed quite a few women also yeah. who have cheated. Um, what have you learned about when women cheat versus your own experience and what you've heard about men cheating? I think it's almost the same. Really? I think that women cheat when they are not being seen, when they feel like their, their spouses, significant others, aren't caring for their hearts. For men, they cheat for the same thing, but it's it's a little mud it's, it's a little muddied. It's like a muddied water. Cause at the end of the day, it's still it's still due to their brokenness. Whether that brokenness is by that person or brokenness that happened by their father or their mother or whatever, it's still brokenness. And so from a relational standpoint, it's still filling a void. So if we break it all the way down, they cheat. Cause a lot of times they they'll say stuff like, men cheat because they have the opportunity. And I'm like, everybody has an opportunity to cheat. You know what I'm saying? And so it's not just because they have an opportunity, because that means when women think of that ideology, they go, well, since all men cheat, if they just give an opportunity, I'm going to stalk his phone. He need to give me his password for this. He needs to be on the phone with me when he goes to work at home. You try to shield him from the opportunity of cheating. No, people cheat because they lack integrity. That's why they cheat. It may show up in different forms, but it's because they're trying to fill a need externally that should be filled internally, regardless of that. So it's dealing with the brokenness that they've had in their past, uh, overcoming generational curses of their family, you know, um, as it was with my father and my father's father, you know, didn't even know who my father's father's was, my father's father was until 2020 after doing research on Ancestry.com. Then I found out. And then, but my dad was born out of an affair. Oh. Never knew that. Never knew that. So we're over here fighting generational curses, not even knowing the curse that 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 happened. And I and that's why I said I want to be a a, a general a generational curse breaker. I said it stops with me. I said it's gonna stop with me, my sons. We're gonna have those conversations which we've had. I've had the sons that I adopted on my podcast. We talked. We talk about the the value of a man's body. I never was taught that our bodies are valuable as men and we shouldn't be out here just having sex with random women. Matter of fact, we're told the opposite. Women are told, hey, be chaste. Don't just give your body to every man. And then men are called, hey, sow your royal oats. Go have sex with as many women as possible. Well, that's a conundrum already. If, if I have created the appetite in my body to have sex with multiple people and then my wife is conditioned to only have sex with a select few, then how do we join in holy matrimony and I am going to fulfill her needs because I'm feeling like now I'm in prison? Which you asked before, you was like, do you feel like you were in prison? Do you feel like marriage now is like, wow. You know, men, when they take their vows, they, their friends are like, well, you got the old ball and chain on. Mm. Why is that spoken of like that? Women don't talk to each other like that. They're like, oh my God, this is the happiest day of your life. You made it. Oh my God, you found this man that's going to honor you. Oh, it's, mm. it's all uh, celebratory. Men be like, ah, well, he left all these other single women for me. You know, I got more of them. I'm gonna and, it's, it's, and, it's, and it's spoken of as a death sentence instead of a moment of I'm proud of you, man. I'm proud that you are going to value this woman. Like, what if we edified each other like that on our on our wedding days? Man, I'm so proud of you. I know about your past. I want you to honor this woman. I'm never going to be your alibi. So don't 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 you ever cheat on your wife. And if you do, if she ever called me and asked me, were you at my house and you lied on me? I'm going to tell her that you wasn't at my house. Like, what if we held each other accountable like that? So that's what's missing in our relationships because we'll begin to be the we'll begin to be the accomplice to the crime. Oh yeah, he was with me. Yeah, we was over here doing such 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 such. She's like, oh okay. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. So why aren't you sharpening your brother? Saying, hey man, don't do that. Don't break another heart. And so that's how I am in my in my friend's life, and that's the access I've given them now. I'll be like, no, hold me accountable. And I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to let you know what I'm doing because I never in my life want to cheat on another woman ever again, period. And, and it's not so much about her. It's about me operating in the lowest denominator of myself. It's, 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 it's horrible. So what have you done to then change and not have gone from the Lateris who was dating his wife that cheated and said, no, I won't do it again, then got married and then did it again, to the Lateris now who can say that and actually mean it? Therapy and discipline. As my platform has increased, 
you, you can just imagine how much access I get to quote unquote vagina. I don't exercise that, 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 uh, that access. I don't. I have women come to me like, oh, I just want this and I heard about this. And what if you do this? And why don't you come visit me? And I'll do this, whatever. It is to go through one and the other. It's, it's, it's not even attractive to me. It's not, it's not appealing to me because when you speak to me, you're speaking to my trauma. When you come to me and you're, and you're wanting to court me with your body, you're speaking to the lowest denominator. I'm a sapiosexual. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm attracted to intellect. But if you're leading with your body, you're, you're leading with my trauma because I'm like, no, I remember I got to be more disciplined than this. I don't want to be a guy that I can just run off and have sex with this girl and have sex with this girl and then run over and have sex with this girl. So even in my single season, I'm operating in discipline mm -hmm. because what you practice while you're single is what you're going to take over into your marriage. It ain't going to just, it ain't going to stop because you say, I do, you know, and which is crazy to me, which I always say one of the craziest things that we've normalized in our lives uh, is a couple of days before the marriage at bachelor parties or bachelorette parties, we got strippers. Here I am a man. I got strippers all up on me, women gyrating on me, breast all in my face, doing all this other stuff. And then I'm going to go marry my wife. And I'm not going to have that image when I, when we lay down on our wedding night, like I'm just going to forget that whole moment happened the night before. And so for me, I want to always discipline my heart and my mind. I know that my mind as a creative can create some stuff. So I have to be very protective on what I allow in my ear gates and my eye gates. I got to be protective over that. I have to literally like, like these are the borders in my mind. Let's protect that. Let's not let that get in your mind because you don't know when that memory is going to recall itself and it can recall itself in the most trying time in your marriage. And now me and my wife are at odds because marriage is going to go through that. There's no perfect marriage. It's going to be moments that I may not like my wife. It's going to be moments where she may not like me. And in those vulnerable moments, what memories, what have I deposited in my mind? Do I have I deposited the word of God? Have I deposited healthy teaching? Have I uh, um, deposited healthy ways of dealing with rejection, what I deem as rejection, so that when I'm in those moments of vulnerability, do I go and find another vice and go, okay, if you, I, okay, I see how you treat me right now. I remember so-and-so. I'm gonna see if her Instagram page is, hey, so-and-so, what you doing? No time, no talk to. It's harmless. I'm just saying how she doing. No, you recalled that memory. It wasn't that you was needing somebody to talk to. You can go talk to a therapist. No, you went and you went and talked to so and so because that memory stopped playing games with yourself. You recalled that memory. Are you hanging out at the strip club? And you like, well, I'm just gonna go to the strip club. So now you hanging out at the strip club and you don't think nothing's gonna happen. The devil knows you showed up for a reason and he has an assignment. So now your wife done got you mad. You feel a certain way. Now you're over here with, uh, uh, give me a stripper name. We're going to make up a stripper name. Uh, I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> okay, yeah, because you may say anything. You may say pinky toe and they be like, I was offended. You said pinky toe. That's my stripper name. So so, so pinky toe. She, she, she shows up and she's dancing with you. She's doing whatever. And then she says, hey, you want to go back to VIP? And you're like, man, just go here. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because a stripper ain't going to tell nobody. So now you're over here. Now you done had sex with her, gave her a couple of dollars. You done did what you did. And then now in that moment of vulnerability, you made a life decision, a life altering decision in your marriage. You uncovered your wife in that moment and vice versa. A man, a woman, women, you know, women, they do stuff on a different level where they're reading all these romance novels, these fantasies, these fantasy novels, and they're having these little affairs in their brain with these characters in the book. Because they like, ah, oh, I love how so-and-so, this character, grabbed her when he, she walked to the door and did this and all, and all this fantasy that's in their mind. And then when their husband isn't meeting their needs like the character in the book, they looking at him like he's inadequate. You know what I'm saying? And I've talked to a lot of uh, friends that I had that are uh, women who are into porn just like men. And so it's like, it's these same fantasies that we create in our mind that get stored up. And then in those moments, what happened? Are you thinking about somebody else while you're having sex with your spouse? Are you connecting mentally with somebody else when you're supposed to be connected with your spouse? Mm -hmm. So it's all those things that just protecting your mind. Yeah. I, I personally think fantasy can be good yeah. if you're then fulfilling it with your partner. With your partner. Have all yeah. the time you want to. Yeah. Um, and then the trust part, I think, is really important as well because it's easy to have a... Um, to be faithful or be in a great relationship when things are going well. 100%. It's when things aren't. And so you said it earlier, I always thought about my husband 
even if a thousand women threw themselves on him, even if there was a naked woman in yeah. like one of his dressing rooms one day that he goes to a talk show and there's a naked woman yeah. and we've just had the worst argument of our marriage, do I still trust yes. that he walks out that room or not? Yeah. And so any scenario to your point where you get married and, or sorry, you get into an argument, you cross, you know, you're like battling each other, you have that seeping thought that then escalates. Um, and so I really think it's at their worst, are you able to trust them? And then the other part I want to make is that you now seem like you've done the work. Whereas when you went from dating your wife to then marrying her, there was no real difference. And no. I think that that's the big thing. I have such compassion because I was there before my husband. I'm, I was with a guy for like about four years and it was, you know, he would be verbally abusive and the next day he would apologise and say he'd never do it again. He didn't actually do anything different. Right. It was just words to get me back yes. so that I could then forgive him and then we we were in this toxic cycle. Yes. Um, but your wife, I heard you say that once you confess, actually, I've got a breakdown. You said in the first year, you just prayed that she would change. Yep. In the second year, you prayed that you could accept that you could uh, that you could accept what she didn't change. And then by the third year, you realized it was over. Right, right. So once you realized it was over, you then said, but she didn't fight for you. Right. How do you feel about that? Because... As a woman, I'd be like, yeah, I am fighting for you. You've too. cheated on me. You've betrayed my trust. Yeah. I'm out the door. Like, why would I fight for you if you're not even willing to fight for me? Well, it was so interesting because it was a, a recurring theme in our relationship. From day one, she would always say, she always reserved like a large portion of herself for me. And I could feel it. We did this personality profile test and she was like 98% contemplator. I forgot what type of program it was, um, but she was 98% contemplated, which means she just lives in her head. Like what she's going to just, you, you very rarely going to hear her thoughts. And so I kept saying, gosh, it's just, it's just, it's just different. It's just strange. And so, um, I would just always ask what percentage and she would never tell me. And then, cause I think we were dating. I was like, is it 85%, 80? And, um, and what I felt was validated when I filed for divorce. She said, I'm glad I never fully gave myself to you because I would have been destroyed. Now, that's as two weeks shy. Well, our divorce was final two weeks shy of 10 years. But she said that to me. And I said, and that's why I'm divorcing you, because I'm tired of trying to get access to you. So it was a, it was a catch 22, but it was so true in both of our worlds. I'm going to reserve myself from you because I can't fully trust you with my heart. I'm saying, I'm going to go externally because these other women that give me access that I just can't get. And it wasn't just about sex. It was about vulnerability. It's about having conversations. You'll find a lot of times with, with people, there's a reason why a guy will sit at the bar and just talk to the bartender about all his problems. He's found a safe place to talk about his problems. It's a reason why I've had friends that were exotic dancers that said that married men would just come and share all their, their, their business with them, stuff that they never share with their wife because he found a safe place. When we realize that as spouses, husbands and wives, we have to create safe spaces for that person. And the only way you can get to a safe space is by granting an all access pass into our hearts, into the other person's hearts and to walk in total transparency and vulnerability. When you talked about walking, being able to trust your husband if a naked woman was sitting in the dressing room, the other caveat is that your husband should value you enough to come back and say, girl, let me tell you what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a naked woman in oh, my dressing room. Me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but most time men be like, nah, I ain't gonna tell her that because she gonna think I had sex with her. But it's like, just give her the truth. You didn't, but nah, but she gonna assume that she... No, um, A Few Good Men, I remember this line, this famous line in A Few Good Men, you can't handle the truth. And the truth be told, oftentimes people say they want the truth, but then how do you handle that truth once extended to you? Can you actually handle the truth? Can you handle the truth of your spouse saying, she's beautiful, she's a hot woman? If you begin to ask him, do you think she's hot? Yeah. You do? How can you even look at another woman with me? It's like, you asked the question. Okay, now I'm going to lie. Train me to lie. Okay, now ask me again. Is she hot? Oh, no, she's terrible. Mm -hmm. Now you train him to lie and vice versa. We train our spouses or significant others to lie when they give us the truth and you can't handle it. And so they say, all right, I'll just go talk to the bartender about the truth. 
I'll just talk to my best friend about the truth. I'll just talk to the exotic dancer at the club about the truth because my safe place, my spouse, my husband, my wife, they can't handle the truth. And what makes a healthy relationship is when y'all can talk about everything, no matter what it is, and y'all create that safe space and be like, hey, I'm mad at you right now. What you mad at? Well, you know, the other day when I said X, Y, Z, you used to act like you didn't care at all. You were on your phone. You were doing X, Y, Z. Oh, my bad. I was trying to do this or whatever. I was listening to what you were saying. Matter of fact, I can tell you exactly what you said. You said this, 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 this. I didn't even think you were listening to me. Well, yes, I, I actually was listening to you. Well, can you do this in the future? In the future, can you say, can you give me a minute, let me get off this phone call, and then I'll give you my undivided attention? Just giving people the truth and, and giving them the tools to be able to, to navigate that space, again, is so healthy because now you say, I can tell my wife anything. I can tell my husband anything. And it's not going to make them run. It's not going to make them say, oh, my God, I can't believe you had that thought. You know, you're saying... Thank you for sharing with me that, that, that place of vulnerability. What can I do to help you with that? Can I play devil's advocate for a yes. second? Don't you think in that situation with your wife, though, because you had cheated on her before you got married, you guys didn't have a stable foundation on trust. And so there was always a part of her that didn't allow herself to give it over because maybe there was that voice at the back of her head that says, he, he's gonna, he could do this again. Yes, in that fact, but it started even before that. So, like, we, we opened up doors. You got to think, I was the type of guy that did not believe in cheating. And again, it's hard to have this, to make this statement because it sounds like, well, if she would have did this, she wouldn't have done that. Again, I lacked integrity. That's the overarching thing. But it's also gateways that happen when, um, I remember this with my ex-wife. She would, when we were dating, I like to talk on the phone. I like to call. I'm going to call. We can talk on the phone all day. We, we can do this. She said, I don't like talking on the phone. And I was like, well, goodness gracious, I, I want to talk to my woman. <laughs> so, so then I remember one day I said, I'm going to see if she's going to call me. If I don't call her, I'm going to see if she can go the whole day without calling me. And it got to about 11.59, and I couldn't take it. And I called. I was like, you was not going to call me all day, huh? She was like, I mean, I mean, if you want to talk, you got to call me. And I said, this is different. Like, I'm used to women. Like, this is so different. But I had the need to talk to my woman. So now let me, let me, let me fast forward. So then here I am with this need to talk to my woman. And I just said, all right, forget it. Rejection. If you can go the whole day without talking to me and it doesn't bother you, then fine. This is what I'm feeling inside. Didn't communicate it. Because she's already communicated that with her actions that she could do that. So then what made it easy for me to cheat? Because she wasn't going to call. I didn't have to lie. I didn't have to do nothing. I didn't have to be like, hold on, my girl calling. Shh, be quiet. She didn't call anyway. So it made, her feel like, it made me feel like she didn't care that much to talk to me anyway. And so then I justified the cheating because I said, she don't really care about me anyway. But just having that conversation, say, hey, listen, like, like I'm 45 years old. I'm grown now. So I'd be like, hey, listen, I need to talk to you. I love talking to my woman. I don't want to talk to nobody else more than I talk to you. I love my publicist, but I can't be talking to my publicist more than I'm talking to my woman. It, it, just, it just don't make sense to me. Uh, well, I'm not a phone person. Well, what does that look like to you? Because we need to find something in here so that I, my needs are being met, talking to you, staying connected with you, and not. Because it, out of sight, out of mind, if I'm just not talking to you, we can go three, four days not talking to each other. That's just not healthy anyway. Even my friends I talk to more than that. And I want you to be my best friend. I want you to take the place of my best friend because we're going to get married one day. But to communicate that, and if that person says, I'm sorry, I, I'll text you all day, but I'm not going to talk to you. Then that's a real decision to make to say, do I want somebody that can go days without talking to me and make a grown person decision to say, no, I need somebody to show up like this in my life. And it ain't got to get to marriage. It don't have to get to six months. It don't have to get to a year of dating and a relationship. You're not willing to try? You don't want that? Cool, fine, done. Because if you're not able to communicate your needs and that person willing to fulfill those needs, you're with the wrong person anyway. Because there are things that your spouse is going to want of you that you just don't like. But because 
again, what I said earlier, marriage has been sacrificial, then you got to say, if you need that to show up the best in your life, I'm going to give it to you. I don't want you ever going to your homegirls because I, I'm just absent. I just don't want to talk to you. Like, now you're over here like, people like, where your man at? Oh, he just don't like going. I've, I've, I've seen people that are couples that you never see their spouse. or And you go, why do I ever see your husband at these banquets? Oh, he don't like stuff like this. And you go, he won't ever go like one time. He can't sacrifice two hours to go to this bank with you. Now nah, he, he hates stuff like this. And they've been married for all that time. He just never would do it, never. And the same thing with, with her. Um, she may not go do this. She hates football. But can you go one time? Like just one time. Sit there and maybe get on this nerve time. Now, what is that? Now, what team is, what's going on? You know, one time. Just like, I don't like that. There's nothing about it. I just don't like it. I'm never going to go. And you go, okay. But if you find that your spouse loves something, you might want to connect with them in the thing that they love. Not saying that you have to love it and you have to become the hobbyist of that thing. Well, at least go to the golf. He likes golf. Go one time and sit there and be like, I don't know how you do this all day. This is interesting. Or you may look at it and be like, this was actually fun. Do you mind if I go go with you again? Like this is this was kind of fun. I thought that this was stupid. <laughs> you know, you running around on the golf course hitting the ball. I just thought that was the dumbest thing ever. But I felt I found that this was very therapeutic for me. So I would like to come at least twice uh, twice a year with you. He's like, really? I, I never told you this, but I've always wanted you to come here with me. You go. I just thought you kind of like hanging out with your guys. Like, I don't care about them. <laughs> I want to hang out with my woman. You're like, well, I never knew that. But in that moment, y'all connected again on something like that. And so just by articulating those needs, I believe that it shows if that person is willing to just show up in your greatest need. Yeah, God, that's so powerful because I think what that does, so A, the communication piece and then really getting down there, showing that you're willing to step out of your comfort zone to do something for the other person. And then if they're not willing to, then you just decide there and then whether you're right for each other. And I think you even said it where you said, oh, well, this is just stupid. It's like even using that language to your partner, it's diminishing them. Yes. And so now you're basically looking down your nose at what they enjoy. And I realized I used to do it to my husband, like he loves playing video games. And so I was like, well, that's a waste of time, you know, like, <laughs> and then I realized, hang on a minute, he actually loves it. And he said, and one day he actually pulled me aside and he's like, it would be really meaningful if you just gave it one, like, he's like, give me three times. And yeah. I was like, all right. And he goes, and what do you want three times? And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, I want you to come shopping and not complain and not be looking at your watch like I'm dragging you around the shops. And he goes, all right, deal. So... We both had the idea that we would do the thing for the other person, but do it with a smile on our faces. There because I think that last thing is like, where you're sitting like, how long is this game for, right? And now you're not enjoying it. You're not actually giving that person what they want. And yeah. in that, to your point, I play video games. I loved it so much. We now play every every Sunday. Every Sunday without fail, me and my husband now play video <laughs> games. But I wouldn't have known that if he hadn't have communicated to me the thing yes. that he really wanted that was meaningful to him and then me reciprocating. But then that last thing is, if there is something that he does that I hate, and I just don't want to go. Like, he, he does a lot of speaking gigs. And it's like, yeah. I've got my own things to do. Yeah. I'm not. So people are always saying, oh, where's Lisa? Oh, she's not at the speaking gig. So I said to him, you have chips. When you really want me to come, there it is. place your chip down, and I will be there without hesitation. I will love it. I will love seeing, seeing you speak. I'm going to be a biggest cheerleader. And I've got chips as well. And so... That communication, yes. that willingness to do things for each other and then having language around it so you don't feel like you're pleading or begging or talking around the topic. Ooh. That right there is, 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 is getting me is getting me emotional. It's getting me teary-eyed because that's what a healthy relationship looks like. Just communication. You said this. It's amazing that you can't get married without communicating. It's called vows. They said, do you take this woman to be this? If you just got silent, they'd be like, do you take <laughs> yeah. this woman? To... Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you take mm. this? It wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to be fully executed. Mm. Matter of fact, you can't even get proposed to somebody or engaged with somebody unless it's communicated. The guy asks a question, will you marry me? He asked that question. A woman has a decision to make, yes or no. We've seen it on social media several times where that question didn't go the way the guy thought. <laughs> and he had his face, mm -hmm. I mean, he just got embarrassed in front of, a, uh, you know, uh, tons of people. 
But that same communication, the will you, yes, no, do you accept, for better, for uh, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, these questions that we are asked, those questions should never cease after the I do. Mm -hmm. And we should always be able to communicate that. And like you said, to be able to say, I'm not going to be doing this all the time. I got my own life, but I also want you to feel valued. Here's some chips. Play it as you wish. I want you to come here. I'll make no excuses. I'm coming there, and I'm going to be there, and I'm not going to be sitting there like, oh, my God. There you go, greeting people after. So this is what you do every time you, you speak. You got to go shake hands with everybody in the audience. You got to go, to, oh, Lord. And he's like, God, you, now you're a burden. Now, now you're making me feel bad about what I enjoy doing. But to be able to show up, smile, and be like, I'm here for you. And he's like, ah, I feel fulfilled. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that's what healthy communication looks like. That's what a healthy marriage looks like. And so I get emotional when I hear what I desire um, executed properly. Mm, thank you. It's been definitely, like, I mean, you said it earlier, right? No marriage is perfect, but it's about trying to figure it out. And I think that what that technique has done for me and my husband is we have both have our needs met. Yes. And we are vocalizing those needs. And there was something you said earlier where you were saying to your ex-wife, um, you asked her how much of her she'd given over and she was like, you know, like smiling or, yeah. you know, you would make a joke 80%. Even in that dynamic, what you really mean is, I want you to tell me what you actually want. I want you to show me your vulnerability. And what she's responding to is, I don't know if I can trust you to show you my vulnerability. There it is. But there you're not saying those words, right? You're like trying to do it almost so you protect yourself. Like, yep. oh, you're not showing me all of you. She's worried. She doesn't want to say that. Yeah. And so because she obviously, I'm sure, has that wonder because yep. that's been planted in her from when you guys were dating. Yeah. And that's what was going on. And that's why I said we get stuck in this conundrum. And then I, I looked back at my marriage while I was married to her. And I said, I feel like it's a story in the Bible where Jesus cursed the fig tree. And the reason why he cursed the fig tree is because it wasn't bearing fruit in season. In the season, it's supposed to have figs. And I looked at my marriage and I said, it's not producing figs. It's not producing the fruit of what marriage is. I feel miserable. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm starving. I'm feeling dehydrated. I feel like I'm not able to show up as my authentic self. Uh, I'm quite sure she felt the same way. And I just said, I have to go ahead and make the bold move to file for divorce. And so, and that's what I ended up doing. And, but one thing that I said, which is, this sounds very contradictory, is I said, God, teach me how to divorce my wife with grace. I said, in this process, we got together, we said these vows, we were friends. If you are God, I want to divorce her and we are still able to preserve this friendship. Now, I ain't saying it's going to happen the, the day we got divorced or whatnot. I just want to, I want to see that we still have a healthy interaction. And when I tell you, it has never not been healthy from the day I divorced her. Because I said, because in the divorce, I just had to be honest. I was like, this is where I'm at. This is where it is. This is what I feel. These are the things I began to share stuff that that um, that I held for for years. Because at this point, we put it all on the table. So then I'm sharing all those things. She's uh, She's looking at me and she's like, okay. And I was like, that's when you got to the statement where you said, I wanted her to fight for me. Is because she was just like, all right. And I looked, I said, again, rejection. So in my mind, I'm like, I share this. This is what I need because what I really wanted, I wanted her, for her to be vulnerable enough with me to say, I don't want to lose you. Because the whole marriage, I felt like I didn't have her anyway. So I wanted her to say, I don't want to lose you. Those words were never uttered. So it wasn't like some arrogance thing to be like, I want you to fight for me. I done did you wrong. I done cheated on you and all this, and I still want you to fight for me. It's saying that I never wanted no other woman. I only wanted you. I was literally self-medicating with these other women because they were giving me access where I wanted it with you. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why I say if men were really, really honest about why they cheat. Now, people cheat for different reasons. You have men to say, I like variety. I just can't be with the same woman for the rest of my life. Then I got to have that commit. 100%. Don't commit. That's my point. Or commit to people who give you that access to have an right, open marriage. Right. Yeah, yeah. But let it be, yeah, yeah. be truthful from the very beginning. Whatever it is, say, listen, I can't, and I've had women come to me. I have women tell me straight up, like, listen, I heard about <laughs> women that come to me and say, I've seen your videos. You talk about being unfaithful in your marriage or whatnot. Hey, if you marry me, I don't believe that men should be faithful. I don't mean they can be faithful. If, if you choose me as your wife, you can have sex with whoever you have sex with. 
I understand. I don't even take it personally. Um, and you ain't got to worry about me messing with nobody else. Or you have women that have come to me and said, hey, listen, uh, I understand women are attractive. Hey, I find them attractive. We can do threesomes. We can do this. And anytime they speak to me like that, I'm like, you're speaking to my lowest vibrational. <laughs> that is not me. I want one woman. That's what I want. I want one woman that I can do all things with, that I can enjoy my wife uh, um, and we can... I can pour into her. She can pour into me. I want my purpose partner, you know? And so, uh, but it gets real like that. But if you are like that and you need that, just communicate it. Whatever it is, communicate. Don't believe, don't bring somebody into a monogamous relationship when you are polyamorous. <laughs> you have a mm -hmm. polyamorous mindset, but you're making someone subscribe to a monogamous relationship. Yeah, it's, it's the betrayal thing, right? Yes. It's not the fact that you slept with other women. It's the fact that, she didn't want you to, right. and you betrayed her trust, and Fast. that's the, that's the problem. And I think that that that's why I really appreciate you know having you on. I really wanted to talk about it because one of the things I think that can knock so many women's confidence is the betrayal in a yes. relationship where you've given yourself over. You feel like you can trust somebody, and I've said to my husband, like I fully have given myself over to one hundred and ten percent, if that's How long even did that possible. Take? Um, when we had a long distance relationship, because I was living in England, and so I think it was like, okay, well, if we're gonna do this, I have to trust that you're far, you can do anything you want and I won't know, yep. know it. Yep. But the day I said I do, that was, uh, sorry, that I said yes when he proposed, it was like, okay, I'm going to give myself over. Now, I was very young, so I think that if you've had heartbreak over heartbreak, mm -hmm. you get more, which I understand because you know how that feels. Yep. And then someone betraying your trust, you start to be protective. You start to put walls up, rightly so, because you don't want that feeling to happen again. Yeah. But I've said to my husband so many times, I've given myself over to you completely. And so if you cheat on me, you will break me. Now, yeah. this isn't to make him feel guilty, but it's absolute to let him know what the consequences are. Yes. And then the second part is I was very honest with him from day one, Latias. From day one, I said to him, other people may forgive, but if I ever found out you cheated on me, I won't give you even a second to explain. I am out that door. Like the second, 12 o'clock, I find out. 12.01, I'm packing my bags. 12.02, I'm out the door. So anything if you think you convince me to say, and I just, I needed to say that for yeah. my own sake. And I've known people in my life who have cheated on other people and I've seen the trauma and the heartbreak that it can do. And that's why I had to be honest with him. I had to, but I also... For my the marriage I wanted, the relationship I wanted, I wanted to give myself over completely. That's what I'm talking about. But I understand why it's hard for people if you've had that heartbreak. Yeah. So if, let's say, people are listening right now and they're like, okay, what are the signs that potentially my partner is maybe going to stray? What do you think those signs were? And again, I'm not blaming your wife, uh, your ex-wife, yeah. Jesus Christ, I'm definitely not yeah, blaming her. But what do you think that those things are that we can pick up on that potentially are signals to the relationship being, having a crack, if you will? I think when people stop asking for the very thing that they're needing from you, and that's both ways. If I, if I keep asking you something and you, and that's why I always say people people don't pay attention to what the person stops saying. Um, what they stop saying is more powerful than what they say sometimes. Because if I'm saying, hey, I need you to do this, hey, I need you to do this, hey, I need you to do that, I'm saying I need, not I want, I desire, I need this from you. Did my needs change? It, it, the, the question needs to be, I know that you don't never ask me this anymore. Why not? I feel that you don't care. What you mean you don't care? Because I've been asking you that for the last six months and you just don't seem to care. So I'm tired of sound like a broken record. Okay, now how are they processing that? They just said they feel like I don't care about them. So they stopped asking. They didn't want to feel like a broken record. How, what, what are they doing in place of that? And then you start having those real conversations. And so I always say the first step is that when someone is asking you certain things or whatever, and they stop asking you, you need to revisit why they stop asking. If that woman is cooking for you all the time and then she stops and you go, hey, I know you don't cook no more. <laughs> she was like, so why don't you cook? Because you didn't appreciate it. What you mean I appreciate it? You stopped saying, do you really? And they say, like, you know how many times I've cooked and 
I looked and you didn't even eat. You come home and you didn't even eat. So I stayed up and I cooked and did all this, but you don't even eat the food. That's very, it just showed me that you just was unappreciative. Well, that's because I ate, you know, before I came home. But you didn't even tell me. But I told you I was cooking. Like, if you're going to go stop and eat something when I did that, you're showing me that I, I just didn't matter. The things that they stopped doing will tell you a whole lot. Um, the other thing about it is when you start looking at different signs that, that begin to happen is that if you have, uh, um, um, like you're talking about openness and trust, if you ask people questions <laughs> and they don't ever give you the answer for it, Remember, I said one of the biggest problems I had, I said, how much percentage do I have from you? <laughs> and that began to be, I still never, ever knew the percentage until it was over. And she said, I'm glad I never fully gave myself to you because she knew I'm not giving myself to you. But I didn't even call her to the carpet to be like, no, I really need to know. And then tell me, how do I get access to the other? Mm, and why? Yes. The why? We, we got married, and we've been married for two years, ma'am. And I keep asking you, how much percentage do I have of you? And you haven't answered that. Can you please give me an answer? It's not going to hurt my feelings. It's a safe place. About 75%. Why is it 75%? You remember four years ago, you did this to me. I don't think I could fully trust that. But you said that you forgive me of that. Yeah, I've forgiven you. Still don't trust you. Okay, that's fair. So how do I re-earn that trust? Keep being consistent with what I've been seeing. All right, so I'm going to check back with you six months from now. I'm going to check back with you six, uh, six months from now to find out where I stand. It's interesting because with corporations, they do that all the time. They do year-end reviews. They, they, when they first hire you, you may be on a 60 or 90-day probationary period. They're saying, hey, we interviewed you. We felt like what you said meets what we're looking for. But now we're going to give it a little time to see if your words match up with your actions and vice versa. And so they look at you. And, if they, and during that probationary period, they find out, hey, we gave you this schedule. You don't even come to work on time. You don't do this. Hey, God bless you. We'll see you later. Or after they become employees, they look back six months later where a company do it every six months. If they do it every year, annual, they sit down and go, all right, love, let's look at some stuff. We talked to your boss, the boss talking to you. We've been looking at your performance. We've been doing this. These are areas of weaknesses. These are areas of uh, areas of strength. We're going to give you an X percentage of raise. You know, we do that. They do that all the time in corporations, but in relationships, we don't do those check-ins enough to where we go, are you still happy? And then you you find out when it's too late when they say we've grown apart. You grow apart from somebody. Y'all are living with each other every day of the week. Y'all are laying in the same bed and you don't even know what that other person is thinking, what their desires, their dreams or hopes for. You don't even know that at first when you met them, they were a school teacher, but now they're wanting to go into the path of entrepreneurship and you're seeing them Google stuff and watching Shark Tank all the time, thinking about entrepreneurship, but you don't ask, hey, you used to watch a lot of educational stuff. Now you're watching stuff about entrepreneurship. Are you want to, you got something brewing in the back of your mind? You want to get an entrepreneur? Yes, I'm, a, I, I'm glad you asked, babe. I've been thinking about such and such and such. They're just doing it all the time. You don't even care to even ask if their desires have changed, ambitions have changed, goals have changed. You I mean, haven't even set up goals as a couple to set up and say, I want our marriage to look like this. Uh, what do you think? What looks healthy for us? We get our marriage gets so out of control because we don't do check ins and we don't do year in reviews. Mm -hmm. We don't do assessments like corporations do in order to strive and become uh, a, a bigger business. But marriages, we just let it just go any kind of way. And, and the person has evolved, uh, lost a loved one, lost a parent. People have lost kids during their marriage and they didn't do check ins to say, now let's recalibrate after these losses. Let's, let's check in with your heart. Let's check in with your mind. Do you feel like a failure? because you've had a miscarriage? Do you feel like a failure because you've done this? Let me, let me, let me, let me see about your heart. You know what I'm saying? And for the man, the same thing. Let me see about you. I know you've always wanted this. Let me check in with your heart. And, and that's why I said we need to be more intentional about our, our marriages, our unions to where 
we do a better job in our marriages than people do in corporations. Mm, oh my God, I love that idea so much. I'm so go-oriented as well. And so what's in the way, how do you get there? And me and my husband have like a list of like 20 questions and they start easy and yeah. it's like, you know, like, you know, like the really easy ones, whatever they can be. <laughs> but then towards the end, we started coming up with these as our relationship got deeper because it's like, yeah, we know what, you know, what makes you giggle, yeah. but I don't actually know... Like, for instance, one of the questions is, um, who was I, uh, what was it that you loved about me that I no longer do? What that question does is, and you have to ask it with zero walls up. Yes. Because you want them to answer it. So now imagine now it's like, oh, you used to do this for me and you don't anymore. If you're like sensitive and you don't actually want the truth, you're going to get into an argument. Yep. But if you go, we're asking these questions so that we can answer them honestly, so that we can then change if we want to we can now come together. And so my husband's answer recently was, um, you don't uh, anticipate my new needs when it comes to food. And I said, okay, I hear you, thank you, because I, because I just, we run a business together. Yeah. So I was like, okay, thank you. What would that look like? And he said, okay, well, you know, I eat my dinner, lunch at like two o'clock. Like if you ever know that I'm really busy, anticipating something. I said, okay, let's go a little deeper. Do I have to cook for you or can I order Postmates? Yeah. And he's like, oh, I don't care. You can order Postmates. And I was like, do I have to plate it for you or can I leave it in the bag? <laughs> and he's like, oh yeah, you can leave it in the bag. So now I know. I just pre-order the Postmates for the certain time and I can get on with my day. Now look, it goes both ways. I tell him exactly what I'm looking for. I was like, I need more cuddles because he's so in business all the time. He works like 100 hours a week <laughs> that He's very much, you know, it's like when he, he he equates business with war. He's like, I've gone to war, you know, and I come back with blood <laughs> on my face. And so, and I'm like, I get it, but I need that separation. And when you come home, metaphorically, I need the warmth and I need the cuddles and I need to have you embrace me. Uh, so he's like, okay. And then he processes, how can I transition from war zone yeah. to embracing my wife? And then now, like literally yesterday, he just... I was sitting here preparing for this episode and I'm listening to all of your interviews <laughs> and he comes and sit, sits next to me and he just starts stroking my arm. Beautiful. And I was like, don't you have words? And he goes, yeah. He goes, I just wanted a bond. See, you try to make me cry, Lisa. No. I'm, trying to, I'm trying to maintain my gangster on your show. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I'm a little soft up. So that, 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 those moments, priceless. Those moments. And that could be two minutes and change mm -hmm. the whole year. Like, it's just those little moments of intentionality to say, yeah, I'm at war right now, but I'm finna call. I'm finna, I'm finna check in with you. Mm -hmm. I'm finna just come down and just stroke your hand, stroke your arm. You're like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Just those moments. And then also, as a woman, I literally just interviewed someone. She's like, oh, foreplay for a woman starts at breakfast. I'm trying to tell you. So it's like... I also just tell him, I give him the keys to the kingdom. I was like, if you want to get some tonight, babe. Start, start well, you, Yeah, you've got to come and give, kiss me good morning. Like, and I'm very okay with that. Yeah. But I think it's got its own, and I don't want it to, for everyone to seem, uh, for people to think it's easy. I've been in a marriage for 21 years, but we've gone through our hardships. You know, I, when I got married, I told him I wanted four children. And then I found entrepreneurship, loved it, and then told him I didn't want any. Mm -hmm. And so... The honesty, the transparency, again, I don't want people to think that it's easy. We've yeah. both had to work on our own mindset, but come as individuals. And I think that that is a massive key of what you talk about and what you've so like eloquently said today is that even though you've explained the dynamic, it all comes back to how you were showing up. And if yes. you don't do that internal work, if you don't have honesty, transparency within yourself, if you don't love yourself, if you don't yes. respect yourself, then how are you going to be in a relationship where you can give that to the other person? Yes. I love it. Like I said, I'm 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 still stuck on your husband rubbing your arm. Aww. Because it's those, it's the, that's that's the feather story for me. Mm. I, I'm so intentional about that moment that um I just bought a house last month. I was looking at lights and little chandeliers for my new home. And um uh, this one company I ended up doing this brand deal with they end up coming out with a new light and it's feathers. So in my bedroom is going to be this feathered chandelier to remind me that whoever I marry as I prepare this home for my future wifey to be as gentle as a feather. Mm -hmm. And so I'm taking that, the pain of my past marriage and saying, I can show up 
a whole lot better in my next union. And that's why I say we can't always stay focused on the mistakes that we made on our past, in our in our past, but just be able to say, okay, I'm gonna learn from this. Now, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, then you're foolish. But if you can look back and say, I made this mistake, I can do better this time around and be intentional about that. And so um, that's what I have uh, that's gonna be installed in my, my home next week is this feather chandelier in my bedroom to remind me to be gentle with my, my future wifey. That's so powerful. What other things have you done to be so intentional so that you know that you don't, you know, because I want to say like slip into old behavior, but I don't want to dismiss the um, generational trauma thing that yeah. you said earlier. Like that really hit me because the more studies that are coming out that even the stress of a mother when you're um, when she's pregnant will then be embedded in the genetic genetics of the child yes. and it can even skip a generation that the stress of the grandmother may skip the mother but then will impact the granddaughter and so I don't want to dismiss that but what are you doing to be intentional so that um, you are able to show up in the way that you really want to communicate 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 I'm never going to leave myself up to my own devices um, with whoever I'm dating with women that I began to be intentional about is to share whatever it is. Um, I'm unapologetic about my past. So for instance, what if you meet, you think I could be with a woman that says once a cheater, always a cheater? Well, you know that's not gonna work out. So if I if I heard a woman say that, then I may not want to pursue that relationship with that woman because now I'm going, I'm I'm fighting an uphill battle. I do lead with my scars. I lead with my scars to be like, hey, these are the mistakes I made in my past. And most women that I've met, they go, I respect that. Because most people lie. Most people be like, I ain't never cheated a day in my life. You find out they cheat on everybody they've been with. So I say that um, communicate, 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 because I want to be honest about my needs. Um, I like sex. I like intimacy. I like lovemaking. I need that in a marriage. I cannot be with a woman who says, I can go without that. We, we, I'm not gonna fight that battle. I'm gonna be like, I'm just gonna find somebody more aligned with me. Understanding alignment, um, to know what it is that I desire, again, with purpose. I have, um, I love helping the underserved. I, before I started doing stuff in foster care, I would do stuff with the homeless. I would go out and do random acts of kindness with the homeless. One of my first videos that gone viral was me helping this homeless guy. We, I took him out on a date, went and fed him and got him a, a manicure, pedicure, facial, put him in a nice suit, all this. And um, that video went viral on Facebook in 2010 to the tune of 28 million views. And, but... And then I'm in foster care. I remember I was dating this one girl. Oh, bless her heart. It was in 2021. She said, I had just adopted my son Armani the year before, or about a couple years prior. And she said, why do you, how could you adopt somebody else's problem? I said, excuse me? She said, like, what? Like, and now you want to have this, this, this foster home for foster kids? Like... Why would you want to deal with that? I said, do you realize who you're talking to? She's like, she's like, I mean, what? I said, I adopted my nephew because my sister was dealing with a drug issue. I adopted this quote unquote total stranger because God told me to the first time I met him. But you're telling me about my sons. Why would I even do that? You don't know what background. It, it, she told me about the Armani. You don't know what his background is. You don't know what his family is. He can deal with this. I said, no, I have a whole binder of everything he's been. I know the mental health. I know all that type of stuff, and I still love him. So being open and honest about the things that, and she's well within her right to feel the way she right, feels. yeah. Just ain't gonna be with me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. It's, it's just not with me, and so that's what I mean by just being honest about what my needs are. And no matter how pretty she was, and no matter how fine she was, I wasn't gonna be like, "Well, I'm gonna try to change her mind." If she meets my kids and and she starts liking them enough, then maybe she'll start seeing things differently. And maybe if I do this, and she'll see, no, nah, we, we're not gonna fight that. I'm grown. I'm 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 the, I'm the big age of 45. I'm not finna go through that. At that time, I was like 43. We're not finna go do all that. You've shown me that we're not even aligned. 
I'm really big about spiritual, psychological, physical, mental alignment. And I want to make sure that we are aligned in those areas to where we can mitigate arguments. Not saying we have to be identical twins, but from the from the core values, we have to be aligned. If not, we ain't gonna work. So take me through those then. Um, how do you assess, I guess, the alignment? Because I think this is super powerful. Um, how do you assess what um, and how you're aligned on each of those? So for me, I'm a very, I'm a Christian guy. I can't be with somebody that's not a Christian. Mm -hmm. Simple as that, black and white. Um, it's just not gonna work. And I've met women that weren't Christians that were really good people, really kind-hearted, really loving, but I'm in love with Jesus Christ to the degree that I'm gonna talk about that all the time. And if you're looking like, are you gonna talk about that? It's not real, I don't know why you believe in Santa Claus. This is just Santa Claus to me. It's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have those conversations. I'll, I'll ask somebody, so what is your faith? Do you believe in God? You know, yes, I believe in God. What does that look like? You know, we break it down. Do you go to church? Do you do when do you check? It, are your checks and balances with your faith? Do you say, hey, before I make this decision, I pray about it. How do you assess situations? And we break that all the way down on a granular level to find out, are we aligned in that situation? Is it odd for me? Would it be odd for you if you came home and you saw me laying on the floor crying before God, praying and worshiping God? Would that be odd? They'd be like, no, I'm gonna get down the floor with you. Hmm, all right. Or they'd be like, well, no, nah, I just let you, I don't do all that. I kind of just, you, I let you have your little moment. I'm like, okay. So it's moments like that where you talk about. Uh, Before we go to the next one, what I love about that is um, how detailed you now get. Because you even started this whole interview by saying, it's like, oh, she said she wasn't really, she said sex wasn't important. I thought, oh, yeah. God. You know, you didn't actually define what that means. And so for you to go from that to then even breaking down, not just asking, do you believe in God? Yeah. You went all the way to, if I'm crying on the floor praying, how do you handle it? That was so strong. Because it's true, because I want that bond with yeah, somebody. Yeah. I want, and I know how those moments get destroyed by assuming. And I don't want to assume anything. You know, um, I've asked people about sexual, I ask people about sex. I ask them about, uh, like I said, the healthy frequency of sex, but then ask them, have you been with, have you been with, uh, have you been in threesomes before? Have you been with a woman before? Do you feel like you need that again? Would you feel like I'm not showing up as a, as a husband if I don't allow you to indulge in that again? Like I ask questions Ooh. like that. They're like, no, nah, that was a phase I went through. No, nah, I did that before and I don't need that no more. All right, cool. Because I know that if you had that experience, and because I, the reason why I asked that is because I had this friend, uh, a celebrity friend whose husband, Every relationship he's been in, he's always had a threesome with, with that girlfriend. He gets married, first time married, he's like, he's thinking that this woman is gonna do the same thing. Cause he just thinks like every woman does Every that. woman should do threesomes. That's just what it is. So he marries this woman and he starts saying, hey, we're gonna do threesomes. She says, I don't do that. I'm not into girls. He was like, well, all, every woman I've been with, I did threesomes. She was like, well, that's, it's not me. I ain't it. So then time goes by, he come back. Can we at least try it one time? She's like, I'm not into that. After she feels so much pressure, she says, all right, I'm not going to do threesomes, but I will give you this. Once a year, I'll give you a hall pass. You can go have sex with whoever you want to, do whatever you want to as many times. Just don't let that come back to me. And you can do it for a week. And we come back and don't let this hit the blogs. Don't do this. And guess what? One week became two weeks, three weeks, six weeks, and it became a whole lifestyle for him, and he didn't want to come back home. Mm -hmm. But if that conversation was handled up front where he says, hey, listen, <laughs> every woman I've been with, I've done threesomes with. If we get married, are you going to be open to that? She says, no. He says, never, he says, never. Save yourself the heartbreak, because they end up getting a divorce anyway. Mm -hmm. So let's just save it. If that's what you need, that's okay. Find somebody to give you that that's not over here. And so I'll ask those questions in the area of sex. I ask those questions about kids, about uh, do you find that, you know, I have three kids. I have a, a daughter, that's my biological daughter that was born when I was 18 years old. How do you feel about that? You feel like, oh, she's 28 years old. She don't need a phone call. She don't, yeah, she don't need my involvement at all. Or do you feel like, oh no, I would love to talk to and hang out with her, whatever. I want to hear those conversations. Uh, with my son, I have a my nephew uh, who I adopted is 15. Do you feel like you can have a relationship with him? Or do you feel like, nah, I don't really like kids like that. 
Let's have a conversation about that. So it's different levels of just asking to communicate and then find out what are non-negotiables for me. But I also extend grace in a level of if you've met a woman that don't have kids at all and she, the, the conversation should be like this. If she um, is dating me and wants to marry me, she says, listen, I don't know the first thing about no kids and teenagers I heard they're absolutely crazy but I'm willing to learn. Teach me how to talk to them, but teach me if you introduce me to them, I'm gonna ask you questions. Are you okay if I ask you a ton of questions after this? Well, yeah, sure, whatever. That's healthy. We can communicate, but, but, but if the person's saying, I don't really like kids at all, then it's like, my daughter one day gonna have a grandkid. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna like the kid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just, it's not gonna happen. So let's just have these conversations up front. But what I do differently from the past is literally looking for the alignment, even from an entrepreneurial standpoint. One of the things for my, my uh, what I desire for my future wifey is for her to join me on my podcast and we have these conversations. I met women who says, I don't like being in front of the camera. I don't like doing all that. That's great. What I desire is a woman that we can have these conversations with. And But if they say, I don't really like that, I don't like all that. That my, my purpose, one thing that I learned in the past is that I didn't understand my purpose and I didn't, I didn't know how to vet for it. And so now um, one of my friends has said this beautiful analogy about how the vice president is vetted, you know, that they'll go behind the scenes. You will never even hear who the, night, the vice president is going to be, but they do extensive work in vetting that person, then they bring it. But I'm using that same ideology about my future wifey. It's vetting to say, how does this look like? I see the goals that I have in my life. I have this, again, Kingdom Royale. Is she? I want her to be involved in that from any capacity. She may come talk to the kids once a year. She may come and help. She may be a great grant writer. She may do. She may be a therapist where she can come to something. But you can't. I can't have this big passion thing that I do over here, and you just be like, I don't want nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. And it's like. My heart is over here, and you want nothing to do with that. My kids over here, you want nothing to do with my kids. My 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 passion is over here because I'm gonna do the same thing for her. What do you like doing? I could date a woman that's a hairstylist, and I'd be like, I don't know nothing about all that, but maybe I can help you get a salon. What's your dream salon? Let's go get you with some architects to build your dream salon. I ain't gotta go learn treatments and processing and coloring and all that, but I can help you with your vision and your goal. Mm -hmm. You know, I can say, I do graphic design, I do video uh, production. Let me create some commercials to get you more clients. Let's, let me help with your social media. But if I sat there and said, girl, you, I'm like, oh, you, you do all that, I ain't got nothing to do with all that. Whatever her goals is, if she wants to be a, or already is a motivational speaker or whatnot, and I'd be like, oh, this is great. I got some context. I can get you over here. I can do this. But if I said, you on your own on that one, she's going to find joy in what she's doing and it's never going to cross-pollinate with my heart. And I want to make sure that my fingerprints on everything that she loves and everything and her fingerprints on everything that I love. And it, it, it don't have to have 20 fingerprints on it. It can be three in this area and one over here, but she has touch points in everything that I love. I love that you've got so much clarity now of what you're looking for. And that non-negotiable thing I think is so important because a lot of us, especially if we're younger, we will just mold into being someone that we think that partner wants. Yes. Um, and But being very transparent and open and having the clarity to know. And then the last thing is, as you were talking, is like knowing what comes with that purpose. Mm -hmm. So knowing, oh, if you're building your YouTube channel, that means that you're going to be probably maybe, you know, like you might be touring, you might be, you're going to yep. be doing interviews. So you're not going to be home at 7 p.m. Yep. So knowing what that encompasses, I think, is also super important. I can't remember who um, I had a guest on. And she was saying, oh, it was Spirit, the relationship uh, expert. Yeah, I love her so yeah, much. She's amazing. And she was saying about how um, people say they want a doctor. But how do you actually feel? Like, what does the doctor actually do? Like, think about their lifestyle. Are you okay with them getting up in the middle of the night to go and have to run to the hospital? Are you okay with them postponing your vacation or your honeymoon because they've got an operation to do? Yeah. Because there's a big gap between falling in love with maybe someone's purpose. Like, oh my God, I love like little yeah. Harris has so much, you know, such a great purpose. But actually know what that means on a day to day yes. and be and communicate that so that you don't then get into um, the relationship and realize you fell in love with the idea. But the reality now becomes something very different that now is actually is. contradictory to the lifestyle you want. There it is. 
It's like, I used to always say this as a funny joke. You want a doctor, you fall, you, you, you fall in love with a gynecologist but gets mad because he looks at vaginas all day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, he like, why are you looking at other women's vaginas? I'm a gynecologist. That's my job. Yeah, that's my job. <laughs> When you look at these vaginas, do you ever want them? Do you want, he's like, no, I don't. I just, I don't think I can be cool with that. I just, I, I there's no way I can be okay with my man. Do, it's like, <laughs> like, what did you think I did yeah. for a living? And in my regard, I have a podcast called Dear Future Wifey. A lot of women watch the podcast. A lot of women are drawn to me. But if you're very insecure, you're going to create stress in my life just by the, mere fact that a lot of women look at me or DM me or respond to me, you know, and I'll give my woman full access to all that. Go, you check the DM, you do what you want to. You have a code on my phone. I don't care about all that. But if you're still insecure, there's never enough you can do to make that person secure. Mm -hmm. So then where I'm finding my joy in, now it begins to be a burden. I remember dating a woman like that, fresh out of my marriage, that it was when I was doing my homeless stuff. I was doing uh, random acts of kindness with the homeless. Well, her insecurity started weighing into me doing this stuff where I, well, if I go do this this week and shoot this video, she's going to have something to say. So I'm just not going to do the video. I'm just not going to do that. And what happened to home blessed life? It don't exist no more. But it was something I enjoy doing. I love, but oppression. I remember one day uh, uh, a promoter called me up to ask me, do, am I interested in touring again? And he said, hey, he said, hey, LaTerris, I've seen what you were doing with the homeless stuff. Uh, why don't you make that a play? And um, I will take you on tour. And I'm touring, making tons of money. And at that time, I really needed because I was broke. But I was dealing with this woman in my life. And she said, if you go on tour, what's going to happen with me? I said, you could you could come travel and visit me. You know, like, well, what is that? She was like, oh, see, I, I don't like that. I don't like that. That now you finna be traveling. Well, when I was married, me and my ex-wife, we were aligned in that. She was a stage man. She was an actress. We toured and did that thing together. Here I am dating this other person where now the passion of my past is resurfacing, saying, hey, you want to go tour again? She says, I don't like that. And threw a fit on the mere possibility of it with the mere invitation of it. Uh, what's that, what, what's going to happen to me? What do you mean it's going to happen to you? What, what's, what's it going to do? Like, I'm going to come back. And you'll literally be gone for about, you know, maybe two months or whatnot. And I'm like, and this is the same woman that was married to a guy in the military? You know what I'm saying? And he was gone for like a year. You can't handle me being gone inside the United States that you can come travel to. I just didn't understand it. But she was a very toxic individual to begin with. But... Again, it made that pressure from that made me not even call the guy back to take the job. God, I want to make sure that's so powerful. Thank you for sharing it. I also want to make sure that this goes both ways, right? Yeah. It isn't just like uh, this way around. There was the story with Jonah Hill. I don't know if you heard about that. So he was with a woman and then she leaked or like released all the text messages and she was a surfer. And so she's in bikinis, she's uh -huh. on Instagram. He hits her up on Instagram because he sees her on Instagram. Yeah. He's attracted to her from Instagram. And then months and months down the line, he's like, I don't want you to be hanging out with these women, the women that she was friends with before she met him. I don't want you to be posting photos of yourself in a bikini yep. which she was doing which is what enticed him in the first yep. place and so now this becomes the double standard of I fall in love with this person but now the jealousy comes over and now I don't want it and so I guess he was just like this is my boundary and it's like well I, this is who I've been since before you've met me and so that contradictory and look I, I, I have the compassion for people in not knowing and working through their emotions. Yeah. And so then you get triggered, right? So maybe that's why that woman got triggered because yeah. she was like, I was married to a guy who was in the military <laughs> and he wasn't around. And now I've got this other guy that I'm falling for and now you're leaving, right? Now, so now you've triggered her, yeah. which can then, I mean, the same thing with Jonah Hill, right? Maybe he's like, oh my God, I'm in love with her. And now his jealousy, his insecurity that he was trying to squash is now surfacing. So I try to have compassion for people, but it, it's a tricky thing. But to, we just want to keep going back to, the very um, astute point that you've made and clear point is that the communication, the openness, the clarity, the boundaries, the non-negotiables, yes. the articulation, the the compassion. I don't know if I already said that, but yeah. like all of that of what you said, I think is so beautiful to have started this interview with who you were, 
and then ending it with exactly how you think and how you approach things. Have now. you saw the, uh, which was on uh, real heavy on social media, some ex, I think is an NFL player or NBA player, but his, his wife started back her OnlyFans page and, um, and she was on social media now crying because she was recording him saying, you, you got a, uh, he, he was shocked to find out she had an OnlyFans page. And, and she was like, when you, when you met me, I had an OnlyFans page. Mm -hmm. He was like, well, shoot, I, you know, if you got married to me, I don't expect you to have it anymore. Long story short, she ended up posting another video where she crying saying he left her because she didn't have an OnlyFans page, which is interesting because he met her this way. And I, don't, they, I guess he just assumed she'll never go back to that. But that's a conversation. Like I said before, when I say if I talk to a woman that's been with a woman before, I need to ask her, do you have a desire to be like this? Mm -hmm. You know, are you hiding who you really are in our marriage? If we were to get married, would you be hiding this propensity that you have to be with a woman? Let's have this conversation. And so that's why I say if we are open and honest and we create safe spaces and we can actually handle the truth, um, then we can be able to make informed decisions and be able to protect each other's hearts because I don't want to ever imprison you in a marriage with me. And here it is. I'm saying, I want somebody to, something as simple as that. I want you to be on my podcast with me. I want us to co-host these, these conversations before. And you go, okay, you really don't want to do it. And you're not going to do it, but you're going to say, I'm going to say, okay, just so we can get married. And then I'm not going to do it because mm -hmm. I'm going to make him be able to accept that I'm not going to do it. Let's not play games like that. Let's just have a conversation. And it's okay to not be in a line, uh, not, not to be aligned with individuals. There's a person for everybody, whatever that is. If you love hugging trees, there's a community of people that hug trees. They love trees. If you have a foot fetish and you love looking at people's feet and getting on the ground and kissing their feet, you can go to YouTube, you can go to Facebook and say, Foot fetishes, and you can find a community of people that love kissing on people's feet walking by. Whatever you got, whatever you desire out there is out there for you. That's why I love the saying to thine own self be true. Because if you can be true to yourself, you can attract that person that will show up in truth with you and be totally aligned with you. Literas, thank you so much for your transparency and honesty in this interview. Where can people find you and your YouTube channel and all the great things you're doing? On YouTube, Dear Future Wifey. And then on my Instagram, Dear Future Wifey Podcast and uh, Laterris R. Whitfield and everywhere you listen to your favorite podcast. If you want to learn the happy secrets to long-lasting, beautiful relationships, then keep watching. And I even heard you say, th um, if you care about your kids, um, take care of their mother. Take if care you of their mother. If you care about your husband, take care of their wife. If you care about yes. your parents, take care of their daughter. That's right. But I really, truly have always believed that. Uh, you know, I just... I just have always thought, I will be a better mother. Mm -hmm. I will be a better wife. I will be a better daughter if I know I've taken some time for myself. And Philip was always really very, always then and still is, very supportive, supportive of me taking girls trips. Mm -hmm. uh, or if I would just want to go for the weekend to go see one of my sisters or having my sisters in or whatever. He has always been very supportive of that. So as I sit here right now, I think back about when we were first married and we had not, we didn't even have two dimes to have together. If I just wanted to go walk around the block, you know, just get out of the house or, or, or not prepare dinner that night. Like, I don't feel like cooking tonight. Okay. He's always been so supportive of, of that kind of thing because I, I've always been supportive of him. Mm. How important, as you're talking, I'm like, wow, how important do you think it is that you as are as strong as you are? And the reason why I ask is your husband is, I, I haven't had the pleasure to meet him yet, but oh. larger than life. And I absolutely had a misconception that you were quiet, <laughs> um, somewhat docile, followed him. Um, and it is absolutely a flaw in my thinking as a female that that is what is needed with a strong man and no. it's almost the opposite i believe it is the opposite and i think it is though that because you're so strong-minded mm -hmm. that that is an element that actually really works yes. and the same with my husband i mean he is 
such a force. I, I say, you know, I could easily get swept away by his giant wave. Yeah. I really could. Yeah. And I have in the past for eight years. Mm -hmm. And I realized that wasn't, that wasn't healthy. Mm -hmm. That wasn't healthy for me and that wasn't healthy for our relationship. Mm -hmm. So I started putting firm lines down, boundaries, Com uh, demanding um, selfish time. And he was always beautiful about it. He was like, yeah, of course, yeah, like, yeah. why wouldn't you? But I didn't ask it of myself. Yeah. And then once I started doing that, it actually helped our relationship because I wasn't, um, I was able to think about what was important to me. And that's really why I wanted to bring it up is that he seems like such a strong man mm -hmm. and you could have got swept away. Yes. So when I go, how did you not? It really in this discussion is really unraveling itself because mm -hmm. you are very firm in your beliefs. Yes. You know, I was raised, again, the youngest of five children. But being a twin played a big part because I was brought into this world thinking I needed to take care of him mm -hmm. because I was four or five minutes before him. But we shared that womb. And I think that makes a big difference, big difference on personalities. And it's made, it shaped my personality. Mm. So I feel like I've been like a strong woman my whole life because I had someone I had to take care of. Plus we were the youngest of five children. And while we were always spoiled and taken care of by our sisters and our parents and everything, I, it just, I had this, this strong personality that I always felt loved. I always felt loved and adored. And I can remember going into my relationship with Philip saying with a personality such like, now listen, uh, you have to love and adore me and think I'm cute or I won't be happy. Did you really say yes. that to him? I yes. love that. Because my father and my, I've been loved and adored my whole life. Mm. So jokingly would say that to him, but that's kind of how I presented myself. Like, okay, so now, Here's how it's going to be. Got it. So that's amazing. I want to give you one extra little thing that you missed out that I think it is so powerful that you do is that you chose. So a lot of people look at their childhood and say, I'm this way because of that in a, in a negative sense. Yeah. No. And everything that you've said, you had a choice. You had a choice to look at your father and find someone that's an alcoholic, but yes. you didn't. You had a choice and look, while a lot of us have struggled and that's such an important part that you have chosen. And there's one thing, a perfect example that I heard you say, and I was like, this is, this is how other people would get divorced over this very thing. You were just like, ah, whatever. So you, I believe your mother had just passed away uh -huh. and you wrote so many heartfelt letters, responses yes, to people who'd yes. written, reached out saying, I'm so sorry about your mom. You wrote, in fact, why don't you tell us the story? Oh, yes. We, I'll start with the fact that we bought an old home. It was an old home. We, we built a home and brand new home. We were living in it and, and someone wanted to buy it. And just overnight, we decided to sell this home and bought this, buy this old, old house because I wanted to remodel it. I wanted to, so we had to move in the middle of the night. It was, we moved overnight and it started raining. Oh, and it rained and rained. And so we got into this old house. Everything we owned was wet. The boxes were wet, everything. And so my mother came over and she said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you unpack, but I'm going to run home and bake you a pumpkin pie. And because she was an amazing cook, she could bake and everything. And so, and I loved pumpkin pie. So she said, okay. I said, okay. So she went home to bake me that pumpkin pie. And then when she called and she said, sweetheart. And I went, oh, is my pie ready? She goes, I just took it out, the, out of the oven. But she said, uh, uh, is Phil there? And I said, no, he ran to the grocery store. And she said, oh, I just, I wanted to ask him something because I feel, I feel funny. And that's when I said, what do you mean by funny? And she passed. So it was so sudden. And we had this outpouring of love and, and, and all these friends came over and here we are in this old empty house, damp house and everything. It was just a horrible time. And everyone just rallied around and helped and everything. So I sat in this old, nasty dining room, musty smelling dining room, because I thought it's very, very important to me to write these thank you notes because it was, it was just a bad, bad time. It's part of your therapy, right? It was part of my therapy, yes. So I sat there and I wrote 
hundreds of notes for two days at least and cried my eyes out with every one of them. But yeah, it was so cathartic. And uh, I got them all written. And so every morning when Philip would leave for, for work, he would pack this little, and I would do it for him too, but he would pack this little tennis bag because he would stop on the way home and play tennis, indoor tennis. And so uh, I gave him, I put all these notes in the z two big Ziploc baggies. And I said, can you take these to the office with you and put them in the mail? He said, sure. So he, I unzipped the side of his little tennis bag and I put them all down in there. And he said, oh, and I said, great. And it was just like, oh, I got that done. Now I can focus on unpacking the house, all these boxes. And it was like six weeks later and I was going to pack the tennis bag for him. And I reached down in there and I went, and I felt those, those notes in the side of that bag. And, and he walked in the room just about the time I put my hand, and he heard me touch those bag, that baggie, those Ziploc baggies full. And I went, oh, and my eyes got so big and I just froze. And he went, oh no. Because he took that bag to the office that day and he never thought another thing about it. And he used that bag every day and he never even knew they were in there. He completely forgot about them. Six weeks later, I'm standing there and I went, oh my God, oh my God, you didn't mail the notes. And he went, oh my, oh my, I'm so sorry. And I went, I thought they knew all this time. I thought they knew. I've seen some of these people. I thought they knew. I thought they knew how I felt. And that's all I could say. I could cry right now. That's all I could say. I just kept thinking, I thought they knew. I, th I thought they knew. And he goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I went, and then just something, the, the sound of his voice, the, the sadness in his eyes. Oh, it broke my heart. I could cry right now. It broke my heart. I went, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And he went, no, it's not okay. It's not okay. I'm going to drive to everyone's house today and hand deliver it. And I'm going to tell them how much it meant to you to write to them. And, and it's my fault. And I'm going to tell them when you wrote him and I'm going to tell them how it's my fault. They didn't get it. And all this time you knew, I said, no, you don't have to do that. Just put them in the mail. And so then I'm like saying, no, 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 I can't. I can't. I have to do it. And I had to just beg him to not feel bad. In that moment, like, as I heard <sighs> you tell the story, I was like, the, these are the moments. These, are the, these moments. are the moments where how you responded is exactly why you guys are 45 years in marriage. Because contempt is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, in my opinion, yes. right? It's uh -huh. like you can easily get contempt in a relationship and you hold on to that. Mm -hmm. And a year later, two years later, three years later, you are at each other's throats. You're not seeing yep. eye to eye. You and never you mailed those notes. And I you, could do that. but And you throw out, you never mailed those notes. And you would have every right to, where people would be like, yeah, he didn't yeah, mail that, those no, notes. No, I saw it. I saw the, the heartbreak in his eyes and I heard it in his voice. He And I knew he didn't do it on purpose. And I so knew. was that it? Like, I just told myself, I know who, because that's a big part of it, right? Reminding yourself of who they are, what their intentions are, and not just the intention, but how they act after. He didn't dismiss it. Um, so how do you, so in that moment, that's a beautiful story. And that's why I want to bring it up because I really do think it's those moments. It's those freaking moments that you, that can splinter a five-year relationship, let alone yes. a 45-year relationship. Yes. So have you had to actively work through forgiveness together on certain things? And what does that look like? Yes, yes. There's, a, there's a, a quote that I think is so powerful that I think really helps define who I am and who we are. Um, I never knew how strong I was until I chose to forgive someone who wasn't sorry and accept an apology that was never given. Because there are a lot of people out there that won't say I'm sorry and won't apologize. Mm -hmm. And, but we do, Philip and I do that. And, and I know when, when he says he's sorry, I know he means it mm -hmm. and he won't hesitate to apologize. And I won't either. And so, and that was just one of the conversations that we had early on, like Philip, here's what will break my heart. Mm -hmm. And you, you need to know, it. here's what will break my heart. So, don't ever call me a name. <laughs> mm -hmm. Don't ever be so mean to call me in because I'll never get over it. It'll break my heart. 
I, I, I'm so vulnerable to say, here's what will break my heart. Because mm. he's like, oh, I don't want to ever break your heart. It's funny because I, I know what breaks my husband's heart. And that what breaks his heart is me being upset. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes if we're in a debate or an argument and I feel like I want to cry, I walk away. Uh -huh. And he's always like, why are you walking away? And I'm like, because right now I need almost to cry, but I don't want this to influence the discussion because I don't want you to apologize yeah. and say you're sorry if you're not, because just saying you're sorry doesn't help you actually address the issue. So I think we also need to address the issue, but I know you and I know that if you see me cry, I'm going to break your heart. You're going to feel bad. And now we wouldn't have resolved the problem. The conversation's over. Yes. Yeah. Is that also why I've heard you guys say, and again, I, we do this too, but like you guys say divorce isn't an option. Like you just take oh, that off the yes. table. Yes. Yes. We, we said that early on as well, because I said, we're not just going to be married. We're going to be happily married. So we're going to do what it takes to stay happily married. He goes, that's right. That's exactly right. And Philip did something that I think every, every couple should do. And he did it because when my mother died so suddenly. Um, it rocked my, it rocked my world really, because it was the first, she was the first person I had ever lost. And so death was a reality. It was like, whoa, she's not coming back. She's not coming back. And it broke his heart to see me so upset, of course. And so I was sitting in our bedroom on the bed one day and just adjusting to everything that had happened. And it had been, you know, it'd been about six months and I, I just had had this one, I was just having a day where I just really missed her. And, mm. and he came in and he was looking for me. He came in and I was just sitting there and he goes, are you okay? And I said, oh yeah, I'm okay. I just, you know, I just had one of these moments where the finality of death is just overwhelming. I said, she's really not coming back. And I, I, I knew that, but I said, it was just, I was just having one of those moments. And he said, I know it's, it's, I know it's tough uh, when you lose someone for the first time. And I said, yeah, I said, Whew. uh, and he said, I want you to look me in the eye and hear me. He said, you need to know that there's nothing you can do ever. There's nothing you can say, nothing you can do that would make me ever leave you. And he said, not that, I, not that maybe you're wondering, but he said, but I want you to know and hear me, look me in the eye. He said, I will never leave you. I'm never going to leave you. And he finally said it like 10, 15 times because it was important to him. He knew I didn't really need to hear it because I'd never really thought it or wondered it. Mm. But I guess he thought, and maybe I would at some point, maybe there would be something that would happen. But he just thought, I just want you to know this. So where was the original conversation? Because you even just said, you know, I know that we always say divorce isn't an option. So he, had you yeah, had he, an initial conversation about that? That was one of our conversations before we got married. When we get married, it's forever. Yes. And it's forever happily married. Mm -hmm. So it was that was part of that conversation. It's forever. Your divorce is off the table. We're never going to get it. Like, I love we're that. We're going to work at this and we're going to make it last forever. So we had that conversation. Divorce is never an option. We're never going to talk. We're never. And we made it so clear that we're not throwing divorce out there and we're upset with each other. Or we're in a conversation about well, you always do this or you always do that, whatever. So as a threat, we don't get to threaten each other with the divorce word. That is so important. Like Tom and I had that conversation yep. early on as well. I actually did say, we're never getting divorced unless you hit me or cheat on me. Those right, were my two right. things. Well, those were, there were, there was, uh, we had the deal breaker the list. The asterisks. Yeah yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. There's a deal breaker list. That divorce is on that list. Yes. But apart from that, I'm with, we actually call it the D word, like Voldemort yes. in Harry Potter, yes. like the, that, thou the who shall yes. not be named. Yes. We use that with divorce. Yeah. Because there has to be that reassurance that no matter, like there are days where I'm emotional. There are days that I've, you know, like acted in a way. It's like, I oh, can't believe I acted like that, yes. you know, and, yes. and you just want to know that they're not going to take the, the, the first opportunity they can to back out. Yes. And again, yes. the threat, if you live in that fear, now you can't be honest. You can't say what you really think. Yes. You can't have the hard talks yes. because, oh, are they going to leave me if I have the hard talk? Yes. So, so we had made it clear that the D word could never be used ever. Like, I think I'm just going to tell him. I know we said this, but 
I think it's, I think we should get a divorce. And you know how people use that for, for drama. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. But we, that's, we don't do that. We've never done that. Yeah. So he made it clear. I'm never leaving, never leaving you. So I, I don't ever, I don't ever think that, but here's the payoff for having so many conversations and working really hard. The payoff is what, what the phase of life that we're in right now. And I'm, I call it the dessert phase of our life. We've raised our boys and we get to see what we've accomplished. We get to see our hard work in our children, bringing our children into the world, raising them. They both are happy. We have, you know, our lives now to live with each other and just, we have such payoffs to celebrate. Ooh, if you wanna learn why happy men still cheat in relationships, then click here right now. Why is it that a man can say he loves you, he can actually seem really happy in that relationship and then turn around and cheat on you? Weirdly, in my experience, it is true. There's a